So let's start our time together with our uh, opening prayer. I should say I have uh, two lovely uh, participants today, or three actually. I've got Indy. I've also got uh, Elizabeth here with me and Shirley. So uh, you may be able to, to see them or hear them from time to time, but they're off to my, uh, to my left, so that would be on your right, I guess. So let's start with our opening prayer, which is the prayer for the fourth Sunday of Lent. That's the Sunday coming up. Gracious Father, whose blessed Son, Jesus Christ, came from heaven to be the true bread which gives life to the world. Evermore give us this bread that he may live in us, and we in him, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. So let's take a look at our first lesson. So who would like to read for us? That's 2 Corinthians 5, starting at verse 16. I will. Okay. John? Yeah. Corinthians 5, reading from chapter uh, verse 16. Paul writes, So we have stopped evaluating others from a human point of view. At one time we thought of Christ merely from a human point of view. How differently we know him now. This means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone. A new life has begun. And all of this is a gift from God who brought us back to himself through Christ. And God has given us this task of reconciling people to him. For God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself no longer counting people's sins against them. And he gave us this wonderful message of reconciliation. So we are Christ's ambassadors. God is making his appeal through us. We speak for Christ when we plead. Come back to God, for God made Christ, who never sinned, to be an offering for our sin so that we could be made right with God through Christ. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I, I must have read the wrong chapter. 2 Corinthians 5, oh, second Corinthians. verse 16. I'd like to ask John what um, translation he's using. What? Uh, uh, it's the New Living Translation, which... Uh, Different translation. Uh, was adopted by Gideons actually. Thank Believe you. Or not. Okay. Lindell House is the uh, original authors. It has gone through a lot of uh, screening through uh, people who know what they're doing. But I rather like the, uh, this is a large print. Uh, New Testament, and believe it or not, I like the uh, the flow of the uh, the words. So, questions, comments, reflections uh, on what we've just read. Anything stands out for you? It is this wonderful promise that. All of these things that, you know, you start looking back at stupid things that you did when you were younger, of course, much younger, mm -hmm. and that this has all been forgiven and you are being reconciled because of, of this, and it's a, a wonderful promise if, if, when you hear it. Yeah, that there's a possibility that we, or that Christ can set us free from our past when our past is troublesome. Other thoughts? I, I like verse 17 and uh, followed by verse, uh, oh, I've lost it. Oh, followed by 15. So you read them in this order. When anyone is united to Christ, there is a new world. The old order has gone and the new order has already begun. 
His purpose in dying for us was that all, while still in life, should cease to live for themselves and should live for him who for their sake died and was raised to life. And it uh, spells out um, our vocation, our job, uh, our mission as, uh, as Christians. That is, we're to live in a new world. And in living in that new world, we uh, uh, create that new world. <coughs> Ed, you had a, uh, a hand up. Um, yeah, my translation, I'll say 19, namely that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. Um, I think that uses the word reconcile a couple of times. Mm -hmm. um, he has committed to us the word of reconciliation. What? What's exactly implied in reconciliation? I mean, we use that word a lot in, 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 in everyday language, maybe, you know, truth and reconciliation, but what's the meaning here? Is it the same? So what, what do you think of when you think of the word reconciliation? What does reconciliation look like to everybody? Um, bringing a, a Agreement and, and um, a lack of uh, and, and removing any um, hurts or discord or um, it doesn't mean you you in absolute agree on everything. It just means that you you're you're willing to maybe accept differences and but not let them become a a dividing device, divisive? To me, I think it's, it's a matter of making one whole. To ask for forgiveness, to be reconciled with whoever you've been at odds with. And this is why God is uh, saying to us, that we are reconciled with him that we can say, we are forgiven. We go, come before him continually through our lives here on earth and asking for things we have done wrong. And he we can come to him and be reconciled and forgiven. So I think that that element of forgiveness is an important part of what he's talking about in reconciliation. So if you look at verse 18 and 19 says, all this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against him and entrusting the message of reconciliation to us. So he explicitly links God's mercy in not counting uh, trespasses against us with reconciliation. So it strikes me that there's a, an influence or there's a, an inference we're supposed to make from this is that our trespasses, the things that uh, offend God or things that go against what God has set out for us to do are a barrier to us being in harmony with God. And so by God showing mercy through Christ, forgiving our sins, it brings us together again. We uh, will be hearing in a few minutes the prodigal son story. And I think that that shows us, uh, to skip ahead a little bit, shows us an example of what reconciliation looks like practically because you've got this son who runs away and you've got two contrasting figures who welcome him back to the house you got the father who runs when he sees him on the horizon despite all of the, the harms that he's done to his father hugs him kisses him kills the fatted calf puts a ring on his finger says you're my son and I'm glad you've returned this through a party. And then you've got the other figure in the house, the elder brother, who says, no, I'm, I'm not going to come in and participate because I'm holding his sins against him. I refuse to forgive him for what he did in slandering my family and all this other stuff. So it strikes me that the, the lectionary committee are the ones who put this together for our Sunday. Why is in doing that? Because I think it sheds light on what reconciliation looks like, which is 
you are now at harmony. You no longer wish ill towards each other. There's nothing that stands in the way of you loving one another. Um, but I think also to say not to push it too far because reconciliation, he could have used the word uniformity, for example. You know, uh, Christ made everything uniform, but he didn't. There's a rich variety in creation, and we're also told he reconciles the whole world to himself. And the world contains Indy, it contains human beings, men and women, it contains birds, and all sorts of diversity that is not all leveled and become the same. But there's some sense in which it's harmony, in which nothing is held, uh, and, and there's no barrier to feeling at peace with one another and working towards each other's well-being. Um, so, uh, John and Christine, you had your hand up? Yeah. After reading from the beginning of these verses, we have a, a God gives us a task to do once we've been reconciled with him, is to go and spread the good news. He is expecting us to not just keep it to ourselves, but to spread it. So I think that's an interesting and important point because you notice how he weaves together. God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. So God's work, but also he says, entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. So what Paul seems to be doing throughout all of this is saying, well, let's step back a little bit. There's two letters we have to the Corinthians, and most scholars think that there are actually more letters, that 2 Corinthians may be this, I won't go into the details, but are a couple of Paul's letters squished into one that somebody sort of wove together. That's neither here nor there, but what it does say is that he had a very fracturous relationship with the Corinthians. He was there for about a year and a half. He founded the church. He leaves it, and then in the first Corinthians letter, we learn that people are fighting, like some are loyal to Paul, some like Peter, who's not the, the, the minister of the church, but is still somebody who's famous. And they think, you know what, we, we should really not be listening to Paul's letters, but to Peter's. And some are saying we, we're of Apollos, which means Apollos was sort of the successor to Paul. He took over when Paul left. So there's lots of things that are going on that are fighting. And, and one of the things that's going on in the Corinthian church is, they're comparing Paul to really slick, good speakers. So Paul, uh, there's a famous <laughs> episode that preachers often refer to in, in the book of Acts, where I think his name is Sisychus. I can't remember exactly, but anyway, Paul is preaching, and they're on the upper floor of a house, and the guy falls asleep while Paul's preaching and falls out a window. So Paul is not famous for being a great speaker. And Paul is also somebody who is not rich, he is well educated as a Jewish scholar. He was, you know, a Pharisee and on track to be really a member of the Sanhedrin. But he's also not, you know, a Greek rhetorician. Pericles and Demosthenes and all these great figures in Greek history who are brilliant in their prose. So people are complaining about Paul and saying, look, this guy is short. He's, uh, you know, he's a Jewish guy. And I don't know, a little, you know, Jewish people are a bit suspect. We've got these Greek Christians who are really wise, really great speakers. They've had wonderful experiences spiritually. Uh, and, and we're kind of tempted to go with what they say because they're really powerhouses. And then Paul starts this passage here talking about we don't regard one from a human point of view. But uh, through uh, even though we knew once knew Christ from a human point of view, we see him no longer in that way. In other words, He's not looking at Jesus and saying, ugh, he's this carpenter, peasant from Nazareth, uh, you know, no formal education, got killed by the Romans. That just so kind of sounds like a loser. Why would you want to follow him? And Paul is saying, no, in fact, why you think I'm a loser is because I'm following Jesus, who in the world's eyes, the fleshly point of view, failed. But look at him, exactly, amen, and he says. And then uh, beyond that, uh, we follow Jesus because we recognize in him is God's power to bring about reconciliation. So Paul is saying, look, if you're mocking me, really what you're mocking is Jesus, because Jesus is the person who sets down the pattern, who with humility serves other people, who doesn't mind uh, suffering consequences and hurts, doesn't care about worldly glory, but instead focuses on himself on reconciling with people, even to the extent of going to the cross. Paul is saying, if God is in Christ reconciled the world to himself, well, God's also in me, and I'm trying to reconcile myself to you. 
to remind you that we are a unity as a congregation, we're unified in the Lordship of Jesus, and we're not to keep fighting with each other about who's the best. So that points us to where we're reading this and saying, yeah, wonderful that Christ is reconciling us to God and forgiving our sins. The implication then is, isn't that what we're supposed to do with one another? If God in Christ does not uh, hold our sins against us and instead reconcile himself and, and is willing to be humiliated on the cross, should you not put up with a few insults, a few inconveniences, just for the sake of getting along and loving one another? And that's what my task is, and that's why I'm willing to be putting, putting up with so many indignities. So I think this is really important that we don't sort of say just how wonderful Jesus is and what he's done, but we also say how great a task God has given us to continue the ministry of Jesus in our daily lives. And that means sometimes we're not going to look great in the world's eyes, but that's not important. What's important is do we look like Jesus? And that, I think, is what Paul seems to be focusing on. So any thoughts on that or comments on, on the passage here? Ed, you have your hand. Uh, yeah. Well, just on that point about you're saying we, we may have to accept some criticisms or about ourselves, but it, I, the other aspect of, is that we maybe have to stop judging where other people are, which is what you know, you, you talked about that on Sunday. Uh, so it, it's, it's this reconciliation doesn't mean, okay, if you, so long as you agree with what I'm saying, then we're reconciled. That's, that's not what reconciliation is, right? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think one of the problems we have sometimes is, A, we don't choose our battles very well. Like, I've got to agree, you've got to agree with me on this minor point, otherwise we can't get along. But B, sometimes even serious things can say, look, we're going to really disagree on something that really matters, and I really hope you change your mind. But I'm not going to stop loving you while I wait for you to change your mind. And the other thing I'm going to do is, I'm going to have the humility to say, it's, it's possible I'm wrong. And sometimes on things that I really value. And so what that means is, is that we are in constant relationship with Christ saying, not only Christ, help me to forgive this jerk who's always wrong. <laughs> But Jesus, will you also help me to see when I'm being a jerk and when I'm wrong and give them the humility to accept it? Because that's one of the reasons why, I mean, I know you can abuse free speech, but it is valuable to hear heterodox opinions, you know, within the church and without, because it's important that we also get views from outside that sometimes say, you know what, I never thought of it that way. Maybe, maybe I'm not quite as certain about this thing as I thought I should be. So I think it's really important that we, we recognize that sometimes that means, A, we have to eat crow when we're wrong, but B, sometimes it means, you know what, I'm not going to let our disagreement stop me from loving you. And we know that in our, or hopefully we know that in our most intimate relationships, because we'll have, if you've ever had a fight with your spouse, or real disagreement with your child, or your mom, or whatever it is, what is it that a family does? Well, you know what, we really disagree on this, so let's not argue about it. Let's have dinner together and talk about something more pleasant for now. In most cases, you can probably do that. Um, some cases, I know not, but we often tend to think, oh, this is a giant case that I can't let go, when in fact, it probably isn't in most cases. Any other thoughts on the passage here? Put your hand up. Yeah. Stephen? Yep. Yeah. John? John? Yeah, uh, I, I would. Uh, there's another interpretation for this that we, as the uh, children of God, become new creations in Christ, and that's what is re what is that part is reconciliation, and uh, Christ made an offering for our sin, therefore. With that being that sin being forgiven, we have become new, new people in Christ, and that we made right with God through Christ, as this version puts it in the last verse. I I think uh, sometimes uh, we have that gift of God through the Holy Spirit that we are reconciled to God through Christ. 
and that to to Christ be all honor and glory. I want to pick up on that new creation idea as well, because one of the things that is really, I think, a helpful pattern to get into is when you see something like a word like creation, we tend to think, OK, this is my creation. I don't know what to think of. Maybe you think of Dr. Frankenstein and his new creation or, or whatever. But when the Bible in the New Testament, particularly and particularly when it's a Jewish writer like Paul and knows the scriptures really well, I think it's usually a signal. He makes us want to, or he wants us to think about God's creation. So when he says you're a new creation, our mind, I think, should go back to the first creation that God in Genesis. And what does he do? He creates a world in harmony, right? Adam and Eve are in harmony. Uh, uh, they're in harmony with God. We know the story of the fall in Genesis 3 and how the very first thing that happens after the fall is that husband and wife are, are naked and scared. The second thing they do when God confronts them is they start fighting with each other. I didn't do it, it was the woman who did it. And then what's the next thing that happens? Cain kills Abel. So it goes from a small fight to their sons kill each other. All these nasty things show the outflow of a unreconciled world. So when we look at creation, I think that Paul is pointing us back and saying new creation. Well, Christ in fact is making all things new. He's making the world new. So when Jesus talks about his kingdom, his kingdom is drawn near we are to start acting and living according to the new creation the new reset i've spoken a few times about paul's idea of jesus being the second adam and how in the temptation in the wilderness jesus does and triumphs where adam failed he sees the food is delightful and good for food but still says no because god said no unlike adam and eve who said oh well it's delightful so i'm going to take it so I think going back to this, it makes us think, if we want a picture of what reconciliation looks like, I think Paul is encouraging us to look to the original creation and then to ask ourselves the important question of, A, how do we live in that way of creation in our fallen world? And B, how do we help others to live in that? So do you create a household in which you model for your children what reconciliation looks like? Do you have a workplace where you model with your workers, your group of friends? And I think primarily where he's speaking to the church, you create a church that models this, where different people are reconciled because their primary desire is that other people be lifted up and drawn close to Christ. And that's more important than winning an argument. And that people are wise and discerning about when something is true where you have to stick to your guns and when it's not. So those are the sorts of things I think he's pointing to. And so that new creation idea, I think is something worth thinking about. So whenever you, again, hear something like creation uh, or Messiah or, or, or other things that are sort of key words, think back to the Old Testament about where those terms and those ideas show up. And Paul and Jesus, of course, himself use this on a very regular basis throughout their ministry. Other thoughts before we go on to Luke's gospel and the prodigal son story? Um, I look at um, the fact that... Uh, Reconciliation, you know, also involves uh, restoration. Mm -hmm. And that when we, we are reconciled with God, we go back to the old harmony that maybe we had with him before things, uh, you know, went awry. It is an interesting thing that I know we have contemporary letters and witnesses from the early years of the church where pagans believed that Christians were committing incest. And why they believed that was is because Christians, from the very beginning, would call each other brothers and sisters. And pagans couldn't get un and understand that because why would a slave say to a rich uh, landowning master, you're my brother? And more is like, okay, you wish, slave, you're a worm, you can't say that. Why would a landowner say that to a slave? Like you're 15 uh, levels below me in terms of social status. They thought, well, it must, it must be some weird sex thing or something. But no, what it is is to say this is a family. Whether you're slave, male, female, Greek, Jew, etc., etc., that there's some new creation. God creates a new family uh, as a result of what he's done. And, and of course, Paul also makes hay with the promise God made to Abraham, you know, 
uh, you know, I will make you the, the father of many nations and, and, you know, look at your stars. That's the number of descendants. Paul argues that we're spiritually the heirs of that promise to Abraham. We're members of Abraham's family by virtue of God's grace, not through DNA and literal descent from Abraham. Anyway, that, that family motif is really important for us to hold on to because, of course, if you know your family, everybody's got a crazy uncle that you can't stand very well, but you still invite him to Christmas dinner, right? The idea is, yeah, he's a little bit weird, but he's family, right? So you stick around. <laughs> Sometimes a stern word needs to be given, but they don't stop being family. Blood's thicker than water, right? Yep. But of course, uh, in Christ, water's thicker than blood. The waters of baptism uh, go deeper even than the ties of blood kinship. Let's move on to Luke's Gospel. We're in Luke chapter 15. So although the lectionary has us using the first few verses of Luke 15, that just sets things up. So <laughs> I'm going to suggest we do Luke chapter 15 and begin at verse 11. Uh, just to understand it's Jesus speaking parables here. So Luke chapter 15, starting at verse 11. And if somebody could read that, that would be great. I'll read it. Thank you, Margaret. Then Jesus said, there was a man who had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, father, give me the share of the property that will belong to me. So he divided his property between them. A few days later, the younger son gathered all he had and traveled to a distant country, and there he squandered his property in dissolute living. When he had spent everything, a severe famine took place throughout the country, and he began to be in need, so he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country, who sent him to his fields to feed the pigs. He would gladly have filled himself with the pods that the pigs were eating, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, how many of my father's hired hands have bread enough and to spare? But here I am dying of hunger. I will get up and go to my father and I will say to him, father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me like one of your hired hands. So he set off and went to his father. But while he was still far off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion. He ran and put his arms around him and kissed him. Then the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his slaves, quickly bring out a robe, the best one, and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet and get the fatted calf and kill it and let us eat and celebrate for this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. Now his elder son was in the field. And when he came and approached the house, he heard music and dancing. He called one of the slaves and asked what was going on. He replied, your brother has come and your father has killed the fatted calf because he got him back safe and sound. Then he became angry and refused to go in. His father came out and began to plead with him. But he answered his father, listen, for all these years, I've been working like a slave for you and I have never disobeyed your command, yet you have never given me even a young goat so that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came back who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fatted calf for him. And the father said to him, son, you are always with me and all that is mine is yours. But we had to celebrate and rejoice because this brother of yours was dead and has come to life. He was lost and has been found. The word of the Lord. Thanks. 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 Well, that is well, a very and something that I know we've heard many times, but I think every time it really makes clear why it's such a popular story is because it's really powerful. So thoughts, comments, questions on this, anything that maybe jumped out at you that's new, even if you've heard the story many times. Well, and I just mentioned- Elizabeth, go ahead. That over there is this, yep. this picture. And it's- I'll show it to you. We, uh, we did a study a few years back the Henri Nouveau and uh, yep. this book. This book, and I think that's why the picture is there now. 
So if you can see, you may not be able to see it, but it's a, it's a famous painting by Rembrandt that's in the Hermitage in Russia, which I guess is hard to see nowadays because of the war. But uh, she, uh, Elizabeth mentioned that, that uh, a print of that painting is available or is uh, up on her wall. So that's on the right-hand side when you're facing the altar near the sacristy door. And what she was pointing out was a, a book called The Prodigal Son by Henry Nouwen, who was, was he Dutch? I think he was Dutch. Yeah, he, was he was a Dutch yeah. monk, but he eventually moved to Canada, uh, lived with the uh, Larsh community, which is a community that uh, cares for uh, developmentally challenged people. And it's a very good book because he sort of looks at uh, the different uh, people in the story, the father, the elder brother, the, the prodigal son, and he sort of reflects on times where he's been each of those different people uh, and what he's called to be. So it is actually a great story. I looked at that. Our men's group at my last church went through that story. It was really powerful, uh, that book. So I've got Ed with his hand up and then uh, anybody else after that. Uh, um, an interesting uh, way to study this these verses is to say, who do you relate to most, the, the yep. father, the prodigal son, or the other son, or maybe the, the slave? And uh, somebody said, oh, I relate to a fatted calf. <laughs> <laughs> well, the fat part, yes, I relate to a little bit, but not always the calf. <laughs> so I've got uh, John and Christine. Okay. In, sort of thinking of um, family. And I, I suppose really we all see this happen in families when somebody dies and leaves a will and somebody doesn't get what they expected to get, it's been given to somebody else. And the fighting, the infighting between families, and it does happen. And years ago, if I'm not, I, th I think I'm correct, is everything went to the eldest son. The most, older son most did. So what, what you would usually get is the older son would get a double portion. So if you uh, remember the Elijah and Elisha story, uh, Elisha is the protege for Elijah. And when he asks for a double portion of Elijah's spirit, it means that he wants the elders share. So if you had five sons, you divide your property into six parts, the oldest son would get two of those parts and the other ones would each get one would typically be it. So. He definitely is cutting into the elder brother's inheritance by taking uh, a bunch of his dad's money uh, because then the elder brother is going to think, oh, well, now he's back and you're spending all this money on him. It's going to be less for me when dad's dead. So that's probably part of it. And yeah, will you know, fights over the family estate are nasty. Uh, really difficult to see when you see it. It's better that you don't have anything to leave and then they don't have anything to fight well, over. That could be true too, but um, <laughs> I will say that I, I know well thought out inheritances can be a tremendous gift to children and grandchildren in tough parts of their life. And my grandparents, uh, when they passed away, left something, well, because they lived in Vancouver and property prices skyrocketed in the house that they were living in. When it was eventually sold, they were able to give a little bit to all the grandkids. I wouldn't have been able to put a down payment on my house were it not for them doing that. So that was a tremendous help to me. So um, don't spend all of your children's and grandchildren's inheritance. Try to keep a bit for them. Well, Elizabeth? I'm just, just remembering when my mother's aunt yep. died and she had, I mean, she managed to get to medical school and become a psychiatrist and teach despite being female, yep. and that was way back when. So when she died, she left her money to her nieces. None of her nephews were to get any. Uh -huh. <laughs> my mother and her sisters and one brother, they just split the money yep. among them so that their brother got the same share. That's too bad. Which, uh, you know, I thought was... Well, that is a recipe for family strife, I'm afraid. <laughs> yeah. But I always thought that was, you know, it really, to me, said something about what sort of person my mother was, that, yeah. that they all did that. No, it's tremendously yeah. true. Uh, I think to, to think about how, you know, store up your treasures in heaven, you know, where moth and rust do not destroy. And that's more important even than the, the financial things that we want to get. So John and Christine, you had another point and then Nash after. I, I think the whole story is a, to tell us whatever we have done, Whatever we have committed in this life, 
we have somebody we can go to and get our slate erased, literally erased through the love of Christ, giving his son for us and that we are forgiven. And this we have to remember, this is what the, the, the story is about, about forgiving and not harboring the to, to just wipe the slate clean. There was a program, there was a TV program some years ago, and it was a, I think it was a minister, a family anyway. And one of the series, he, he went to heaven and he was showed how an eraser in the hand can wipe away all his sins. And I remember that. And this is what God does for us. We confess, he forgives, and we can be with him. Yeah, he took away what, what stands in the way between the brother and the father. Nash. A couple of points. Uh, the uh, son asking for his inheritance, you know, uh, really showed that he didn't care about the father because Usually you won't get the inheritance until the person is dead. So he really wished his father was dead. Taking his, uh, you know, money yeah. and, and uh, going away. And the second point is the uh, son getting the job, looking after the uh, pigs. First and foremost, he's Jewish. <laughs> and Jews, Jews usually don't go around pigs. So for him, not just you know working with the pigs, but trying to eat their food on top of it shows how he's hit rock bottom. Yep. You know, so the kind of you know situation we are in, you know, that God will call us from. You know, we really have to hit rock bottom. I also wonder how sincere that younger son was because he had rehearsed all of his speech to his father. And um had it all ready. And so I wonder about his heart, truly. Um, you know, was he planning this, uh, knowing, knowing his father would forgive him? Um, did he really have a change of heart when he saw how warmly welcomed he was and that his father truly loved him? And perhaps he didn't realize that before. I wonder what happened before this story in the family? What were the relationships like? And why did he feel this way to demand his, um, his inheritance before his father died in such a, a harsh way? So it makes me wonder about uh, the dynamics. I wonder a little bit about that too, because, and not to focus much on the elder brother here, but it does reveal something about his mindset, which is, his father says, look, everything I have is yours. You could have had a goat anytime you wanted. What stopped him was he never asked. He thought, his, my, do my father doesn't love me very much. He's not going to give me any of this, so I'm not going to bother asking. Maybe the younger son thought the same thing and said, my dad's never going to give me anything of his free will, so I'm going to demand my rights, which is divide the will, give me the portion, and then we're free of each other and we can leave. And he misjudges his father. It's interesting that some of the, the harsher parables Jesus tells, like the parable of the talents, you may remember he gives away to three different slaves uh, different amounts of money. One, uh, you know, five talents, one, two, one, uh, one, and he goes on a journey. The five guy uh, invests and gets a big windfall. The two talent person gets a big windfall. The one talent one just buries it. And when the guy asked, well, the, uh, the, the master asked, why did you just bury it? And he said, well, because I know you're a hard man and you demand uh, a, um, you know, a harvest where you haven't sown. In other words, he, the slave is saying to the landowner, I know what a jerk you are. Uh, and I know that you would not put up with me losing a penny. So I f figured I'd play it safe. And, and I think that the, the landowner, the, the master gets angry because he, as of his judgment of character, not because he lost any money. And I think of the same thing here is, is that the father says like, son, you, 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 do you not realize that all this time I, who I am, you don't know me very well. And I think probably the, the prodigal one 
would have been inspired to leave because he had the same problem, but he only realized his assessment of dad was wrong when he messed up. And I'd also say that for some people, you know, we all know that some people only learn the hard way, right? Mm. Like, uh, don't touch that stove, it's hot. <laughs> oh, okay, I'm not gonna touch it now. You are right. Some of us have, you know, you can identify one of your kids or maybe all your kids or friends or whoever it is. Maybe you're like that yourself. But that also means that God, I think, understands that some of us have to learn the hard way. And so instead of him rubbing it in to the son, he says, welcome back to the family. Um, and I also think, too, about the motivation of the son. We don't entirely know. Is he, you know, why, why is he coming back? It's just because he's desperate. Well, at the same time, I mean, isn't that sometimes why we come back to God, right? It's like, I can't do this alone anymore, so God, finally, I'll, I'll do what you say. Not because, oh, Jesus, I've realized how wonderful you are, and I want to love and follow you all the days of my life. Sometimes it's just because you boxed me into a corner, God, and I got no choice. But God says, okay, I'll take it. <laughs> you know, and, and for, you know, over time, you'll come to love me and understand my character. But for now, pull a chair up at the table. I'll feed you. You need a little bit of help. I'll give you the loving kindness. And eventually, you'll see what kind of person I am. But I think that that is something that we have to acknowledge that sometimes our over-examination of our motivation doesn't help. Just be glad you came back to Jesus. Worry about your motivation later. Um, because God says, you know, I'm, I'm going to take you back. But I also think over time, you know, God boxes us into corners and says, okay, you're back, but I can look in your heart and I see you've closed a whole bunch of doors to me and I'm just gonna keep knocking until you open one of them. And you finally open one and you let him in a little bit more and then you say, fine, God, now you can leave me alone. And then he moves on to the next door and starts knocking. And so that's the way God works. And so we look at the prodigal son, he may have been very selfish in him coming back. I just want a hot meal. But I hope he learns something from the way his father treats him because he's obviously bruce bracing himself to be treated like a hired hand the fact that the father has no real legal obligation to treat him anything better and yet he still does probably works on his heart over time but we'll see too bad there's no sort of sequel to that story it'd be nice to hear what happens <laughs> so i've got uh christine and john and then i've got nash Okay, it, it brought, as you were speaking, it brought to me as our lives now today, we carry on every day in our own sweet way. And we wonder why we're having a difficult time until we realize that we are doing it on our own and we're not accepting God's help in what we're doing. And we have to say, forgive me and come and help me. Well, there is a humility, right? Which is the son, I'm sure why he's bracing himself is, you know, he hoisted himself on his own petard. I can do better than you, dad. I've got a better way of planning my own life. And then everything goes and collapses. Like there's gotta be, like regardless of his motivation, he's really gotta swallow his pride to go back. Don't we have to do that with God plenty of times? You know, I, I had a con conscience twinge, but I did it anyway, because I wanted to have my own way. And then we have to come crawling back to God and say, you know what, you were right, this was a big mistake. That requires swallowing our pride. But at the same time, we come expecting God will be like the elder brother who says, okay, snivel and be a worm in my household for a while. And instead God treats us like, I'm just glad you're back. And that's a different thing and something I think is really important for us to hold on to when we find it hard to swallow our pride. Mm -hmm. Nash and then Bill. Yeah, I, I had, uh, when I was in uh, high school and a Jesuit uh, monk came to our school to preach on this very uh, you know, gospel reading. And the first thing he said was, Jesus has told a bad story. And that alarmed all of us he being a Jesuit. And uh, his explanation was that if any kid reads this story, he will think, oh, I can go and uh, screw up and I can come back home and I just have to say that I'm sorry and I'll be taken in. Right. So that encourages people to you know, right. go and do bad things actually. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that, you know, it's interesting because that is a good point. But I also think sometimes we try to put more weight on a parable than we should. 
In other words, I think just because he tells this one parable doesn't mean that is all there is to know about reconciliation. So anybody who's been in a relationship with, you know, an addict or a person who's got really, you know, inappropriate behavior, I think a lot of times you come in and again, like kill the fatted calf, you have a party, but we don't hear the rest of the story, which may be, okay, son, here's the rules of the household that I want you to follow. And that just like it is with a toddler, right? It's like, I start giving you more responsibility as you grow older and become more mature because it is irresponsible for me to say, okay, you know, here's the crayons, uh, I trust you with it, because you come back and you'll write over the wall again. <laughs> with an addict, same thing, it's like, oh, I'm glad you're back, now here's a whole bunch of money, now, now I, I trust that you're not going to use alcohol again. Well, that's, that's not a wise policy. <laughs> I do think that the forgiveness and welcoming into the family is really the important point. I don't think it necessarily tells us how everything should work. Like, I find the same thing when it comes to the parable of the vineyard or the, the, yeah, the vineyard where people come at the last hour and get paid the same as those who came at the first hour. Like that's not how you run a business in this world. So I don't think this is Jesus's school of business advice. I think instead it's Jesus' school of how the kingdom of heaven works, which is, you know, fairness takes a second seat and it drives us nuts if we think where the elder brother has been good. Fairness takes a second seat to God's mercy. And the story of the 99 sheep who do what they're supposed to do by on the hill. And then we get the one sheep who's a dummy and goes off and wanders. What happens? Well, the shepherd goes and <laughs> brings it back. Shh. <laughs> Shush. Anyway, all that is to say is, is that don't read too much into this. Yes, there should be boundaries in many yeah. things. And sometimes uh, just a blanket forgiveness actually harms a person more than helps them. Bill. Oh, I was just going to make a couple of observations. Um, I, I've always, well, for recent years anyway, been intrigued by the notion that this parable has been given in popular parlance the wrong name. That the parable should be known as the parable of the loving father sure. or the parable of the two screw up brothers. <laughs> because each of them no 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 i i it sounds funny to say it that way but each of those two younger guys in their own way have uh become estranged from their father and 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 screwed up that relationship yep. and the loving father etc the second thing is um and i'm not even sure if, if it's even important but did anyone ever notice the relationship between the word prodigal, P-R-O-D-I-G-A-L, and the word prodigy? Oh, yeah. <clears throat> Same root words. Um, and uh, whereas a prodigal is, is this guy from the story, a prodigy um, in my grandson's music relationships, when I go to the concert, there's some kids that are just brilliant in their ability to play their chosen instrument those are the prodigies and yet this other one is a project goal and i and i there's a meditation that can be developed i think the fine line between the brilliance of the younger son uh the prodigy part of him and the screw upness of him the prodigalness of him. And the third thing is to go back to draw the relationship between this story and where Paul begins or uh, where, uh, where Paul is writing about the new world, the new creation, the new relationships, the new way of being. And Jesus, we, we spend... I think we miss the point of the story to go echo my first point. We miss the point of the story if we focus only on the sons or primarily on the sons. We need to see the father as the, uh, for lack of a better word, um, enfleshment, not incarnation, but you know, making real of the new world uh, into which Jesus. Uh, Jesus calls us. And uh, just to make those uh, couple of couple of points and uh, 
I could go on, but I'll stop there. Thank you. Okay, give Bill the last word there. Uh, so <laughs> just because their time is drawing. So, <laughs> so enjoy it, Bill. Oh, uh, thank you. I cherish every moment. <laughs> let's let's pray. We'll pray. You know, I think both of these passages are really powerful ones, not only the, the profligacy of God's mercy and grace, but also remember Paul's exhortation that we are to be ambassadors for Christ. We are to be ambassadors of reconciliation. And the way we do that is, yes, through word, but it's through our actions. And being reconciled sometimes costs us something. When you agree to let go of a legitimate beef you have with somebody for the sake of the gospel, that's a, that's a powerful statement because that does not happen very often in this world. So let's pray for that and also remember that God's grace is such that even in Ukraine, we can hope and pray for reconciliation there. Not only an end to the violence, but reconciliation of, you know, neighboring nations. Because uh, there's going to have to be a lot of reconciliation after this terrible event. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for causing these holy scriptures to be written through your spirit. For your servant Paul and your servant Luke, who have illuminated for us what it is we're called to be. We're called to be ambassadors of Christ, to live out our lives in such a way that Christ's reconciling work is made clear in us. Help us, first of all, to embrace that whether we are the elder son who refuses to accept the generosity of the father, or whether we feel more like the younger son or even the fatted calf, Lord, that we recognize our part in your kingdom. Help us, Lord, to take on the character of this father who is patient with those who just don't get the, the, the reconciling work of the kingdom, but also that we are merciful towards those who really disappoint us. Let our daily lives be lives grounded in the confidence we're forgiven, reconciled, and loved. But let it also be grounded in action so that we might truly love and be reconciled with those around us, especially for this church, that we might be a place of reconciliation. We pray for this troubled world in which hatred and violence are so common. And we pray especially for Ukraine and Russia, in which the terrible violence going on haunts our screens, what I know is deeply troublesome for many people. Protect the innocent, bring about peace, bring a real hope of reconciliation. I pray, Lord, these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Bye, everybody. Hi, everyone. Thanks, everybody. Bye. 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 Bye.